There is a serious downside to Ozempic or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And you've seen a lot of people talking about it online. It's the whole idea of the, the muscle wasting thing. But just because you look at someone and say, hey, they lost muscle, doesn't mean that they did. And I know we can see it in people's faces. They call it Ozempic face because people are losing weight so fast, they lose the musculature in their face and they look kind of drawn in. But although I understand and I appreciate anecdotal experiences, I really do like to look at the data. So we have to first understand what GLP-1 receptor agonists or Ozempic is, okay? So GLPs are peptides produced in the gut and the ultimate purpose of it is to help increase insulin secretion so it helps increase the glucose uptake. But then as a result of that, it's also reducing appetite and also delays gastric emptying. So you need less food because it's digesting a little bit slower. So people tend to eat less, but the primary purpose of it is actually as a glucose modulator. So huge implications, huge effects for people that are having metabolic issues or potentially diabetic. And also of course, for people that need to lose weight, but in a way that's almost a side effect. But let's look at some literature. There's a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it took a look at 1,961 participants for 68 weeks. They gave them 2.4 milligrams, which is more like the Wagovi dose. So a little bit higher dose than you'd see with Ozempic, but still a pretty hefty dose for 68 weeks. They typically had subjects try to reduce their calories by about 500 and they had them walk for 150 minutes per week. Okay, over the course of these 68 weeks, they lost a lot of weight. The GLP-1 group lost 14.9% of their weight versus 2.4 in the placebo group. So huge difference in weight loss with Ozempic GLP-1 versus placebo. But if you look at a study that was published in Diabetes, Obesity, and Metabolism, they gave subjects a half a milligram or one milligram, and they were looking at reductions in HbA1c. And there was a 1% in the half milligram and a 1.38% drop in the one milligram when it came down to GLP-1 in their HbA1c. Now, what does that mean? HbA1c is like your lagging sort of three month indicator of how high your glucose has been over the last three months, the simplest way to put it. So a 1% drop in that is significant. So there's no denying GLP-1 receptor agonists work. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't pretend to be one, but there's definitely something there. Okay, the biggest side effect we have to talk about published in The Lancet, 11 to 20% or so end up with nausea. I've known a lot of people that have taken this, and I will tell you in my personal experience, this is not real data, it's just me, I think it's more like half experience nausea and about 20 to 30% seem to experience vomiting. Whereas The Lancet publishes 11 to 20% nausea and about 10% experience some vomiting. So yeah, you're gonna lose some weight if you're nauseous and vomiting. But if we go back to that study I talked about at the beginning of this video, the New England Journal of Medicine, that Ozempic study, the 68 week one, what was alarming with this study is that subjects lost 15 pounds of muscle in that 68 week period. That's a lot of muscle loss, a whole lot of muscle loss, even with that much overall weight loss. But then there was another study published in the European Reviews for Medicine and Pharmaceutical Science. This was interesting because they had subjects for 24 weeks, for six months, go on a dose of GLP-1. And they found in this particular case, they lost a lot of weight, but they lost about three pounds of muscle. Three pounds of muscle over six months. It sounds like not that much, but when you consider that in someone that is not resistance training, through one decade, they'll lose about four to six pounds of muscle. So you basically accelerated almost a decade's worth of muscle loss into a six month period. Albeit, they were losing a lot of weight too. So you have to ask yourself the question in this case, okay, like what's more important, getting the fat off of me or maintaining the muscle? I would argue both, because if you can get the fat off of you and you can maintain the muscle, you run a higher likelihood of keeping the weight off. Now, Dr. Peter Atia had some things to say about this. I'm gonna read a quote from him because he was very opposed to sort of what was happening with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Almost every patient that we put on this drug has lost muscle mass at a rate that alarms me. So he claims that the FDA doesn't really account for the muscle loss and they typically don't. In fact, he continues, so of all the studies, the FDA has forced primary outcomes to be weight loss. They don't care about body composition. I mean, he's not wrong, but I don't think that they're out there saying like, we don't care about body composition. They're just saying like, hey, the bigger outcome is weight loss. Let's just get people to lose weight. So, I do agree with him. However, I also agree with where the Nadolsky brothers stand. 
and that's Carl and Spencer. I know Spencer Nadolski, at least from just communication a little bit on Instagram, but he claims that, hey, like we shouldn't be really balking at this too much because this is right on par with the amount of weight that people or muscle that people lose when they just generally lose weight in my practice to begin with. He's not wrong because people do lose muscle when they lose weight. It all depends on how you lose weight. And we're going to talk about some ways that you can sort of prevent this, some interesting ways outside of just eating protein, right? Like some interesting, maybe more unconventional, untalked about ways. But Spencer Nadolski is right. I mean, people do lose weight, but maybe with Ozempic or with GLP-1, they're losing a little bit faster and they don't have a chance to sort of put these lifestyle practices in place to offset some of the muscle wasting. But then it doesn't answer why people lose so much muscle in their face. Like that is a, such a characteristic of people that are taking GLP-1 receptor agonists. I've noticed it in friends and family. Like when they go on it, their face gets drawn in. It's something we do need to be aware of. But how do we prevent this muscle wasting? I mean, how do we put some stops in place that this doesn't happen? Before I give you sort of those things that you can do, there is some also good news. There is some early mechanistic evidence that we actually have GLP receptors in our vascular system. So our vascular endothelial cells actually express GLP receptors. So when we consume or we use GLP-1 receptor agonists like Ozempic, it might actually bind to these cells in our vascular system. And there's some literature to suggest that there can be a 30 to 40% increase in microvasculature blood flow in the muscle. This means more oxygen getting to the muscle, means potentially more nutrients getting to the muscle. And if someone becomes more insulin sensitive as a result of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, it might actually make their muscle anabolism better. So there is some mechanistic evidence that it could help you build muscle. But the biggest caveat is the training. And I've got a very intriguing body of literature that is gonna almost certainly encourage you to get your butt to the gym. This was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They had subjects go on an 800 calorie restricted diet for a period of weeks. Subjects lost a lot of weight, 35 pounds, okay? But they had one group during the study resistance train and one group stay sedentary. Then they did a muscle biopsy at the end. Despite only eating 800 calories, the group that resistance trained didn't just maintain muscle, they built muscle. There's so much more than just the protein equation, especially for a newbie. If you don't typically resistance train and you start resistance training, if you've never resistance trained before, and then you go to your doctor and you get put on Ozempic and you start resistance training, even in a calorically reduced state, because you're a newbie, you're probably gonna put on muscle. It's one of the most protective things you could do. And we see this with such low calorie diets that resistance training, especially in untrained people, is like the most flat out important thing. The other thing that's really interesting is there's cool data on a compound called urolithin A. So urolithin A is usually in like walnuts and pomegranates. Most of the literature with urolithin A is looking at like a concentrated, almost supplemental form of urolithin A. But what this can do is it increases mitochondrial respiratory chain complexes and essentially is making it so the mitochondria in your muscular system is stronger, more efficient, better at using fuel, better at creating ATP, more efficient at creating energy, in essence, making you potentially stronger. So there was a study that was published in Cell Reports that had subjects consume 500 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams, or a placebo of MitoPure, which is a branded form of urolithin A. They saw a 10 to 12% increase in leg strength, an increase in their VO2 max, an increase in their overall mitochondrial function, and when they did a biopsy, their overall mitochondrial health was better. This is the kind of thing we need to be paying attention to when you're maybe taking like Ozempic or you're on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. If you're losing muscle and you're losing strength, the more that you can potentially increase the energetics of the mitochondria and your muscle, the stronger you'll be despite that and hopefully have a muscle preservation effect. I put a link down below if you want to check out a company called Timeline. That is really the only company I know of that has legitimate urolithin A. In fact, they utilize MitoPure. It's MitoPure that we've seen in these studies in cell reports. There's also big studies in JAMA and a number of other research bodies. I highly recommend you check it out if you're looking at performance or you're looking at preserving or potentially even building muscle. And again, they've been a sponsor on my channel for a number of years. So I don't want the net impression of this video to be you need to buy this product. The most important thing is exercise, sleep, and protein. If you do those things, you will likely not lose 
muscle when you are taking something like this. Okay, I can agree. Those are the most important things. But the literature on urolithin A in a calorically restricted like state to try to increase muscle is pretty awesome. And I'll take a 10 to 12% increase in leg strength any day of the week. And again, more data needs to be done, but very, very promising stuff. So that link down below for Timeline, it also gets you 10% off. So highly recommend you check it out. They've got a powder form and a capsule form. It's in the top line of the description underneath this video. Another supplement you may wanna consider taking is taurine, because taurine is going to drive down the oxidative damage that comes from muscles being used, from overall training. So if you're like overworking a muscle, it creates a lot of oxidative stress, which can actually be very damaging and help you eventually be detrimental to your body. But there's also an increase in sort of glucose uptake. So there's a metabolic effect with taurine as well. So highly recommend that. Essential amino acids. Okay, this is something so inexpensive and so effective. There's a lot of bodies of literature that show that between five and 10 grams of EAAs, not BCAAs, but essential amino acids can improve muscle protein synthesis, can decrease muscle wasting, can actually increase muscle anabolism. And if you take EAAs along with protein, it can increase the availability of those aminos to be used for muscle protein synthesis. So if you're trying to get the most bang for the buck and you're having a hard time getting more protein in, adding just simple EAAs to sip on, that could be hugely effective. Plus, they're very anti-catabolic. So the literature was kind of dodgy up until recently. We're starting to see more that if you sip on EAAs throughout the day in a caloric deficit, it may very well help prevent muscle wasting. So highly recommend that. And of course, the obvious one, creatine, but hear me out on this. I would recommend that you dose your creatine slowly throughout the day, like one gram in the morning, one gram in the afternoon, one gram at night, maybe only go to like three or four grams because there is a water retention effect. And if you're trying to lose weight, your mind might get a little bit funky if you're gaining weight from water retention because creatine will do that. But it increases basically the ability to synthesize ATP via the creatine phosphate system. So you're creating more energy, but it's also got anti-inflammatory effects, pro-recovery effects, sleep effects. So huge things there. Speaking of sleep, if you're going to be taking something like this, it goes without saying, you need to prioritize sleep. But here's one more interesting thing. There was a study with protein that had subjects go into a 40% caloric deficit. And that is actually around where a lot of people end up if they're taking a GLP-1 receptor agonist. They end up eating about 30 to 50% less. So let's call it a delta of 40. Okay, well, in this particular case, when subjects were eating 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight compared to 2.4 grams per kilogram of body weight, basically the most important thing was the more protein they had, the more muscle they spared, despite being in a serious caloric deficit. As a matter of fact, the 1.2 gram group stayed about the same. They maintained muscle decently. The 2.4 gram group increased muscle despite being in a 40% caloric deficit. So as long as you're not being extreme and you're appropriately supplementing, you're getting good sleep, you're training, most important, getting enough protein, second most important, using things like urolithin A, things to support this, I don't see how you would run into a lot of issues. However, I am not a doctor. I'm some dude on the internet. But the interesting thing is, the literature is all there for us to read. So we need to look at it ourselves and distill it appropriately. I'll see you tomorrow.